Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, we're going to kick things off in just another couple of minutes. Uh, so stay tuned. Okay, because she's just like me. It makes it worse when someone picks up. <laughs> That's okay. I do it anyhow. Like, you know. Yeah, well, it's funny. I would ask that uh, until the Q&A section, if you all would remain on mute or type your questions via the chat feature, that would be very helpful to us to avoid background noise. If you're just joining, we are giving folks another couple minutes to get logged on and we'll get started shortly. When you're, when you're ready. Sure. All right. Okay. Okay. Yep. All right. All righty, Sarah. Well, uh, this is Val. Good morning, everybody. Um, Sarah, if we're good to go, I am happy to kick fun. us off. Absolutely. Awesome. I guess you can hear me. So great. Fantastic. And good morning um, again, everybody. It's fantastic to see so many of you joining us for the overview of the 2020 export program for the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. I see a lot of familiar names. So, hey, everybody, how you doing? Um, it's good to see you all virtually. And um, we're excited to see a few new uh, faces and names. And we're excited to get to know you better as well. Um, as you kind of may have already read and you're here, so you're interested, uh, so you likely know that the export program is an initiative that's funded by the USDA, Foreign Agricultural Service, through the Market Access Program, which uh, we lovingly call MAP. Uh, lots of acronyms in our world. Um, so the New York Wine and Grape Foundation is proud to be a partner uh, with the MAP program. Um, essentially, they're partnering with us to kind of cost share uh, overseas marketing and promotional activities that are designed to help build the export market for New York wine. And that's essentially it in a nutshell. Um, so before uh, Sarah Gelpi, who I'll introduce in a, in a moment, takes us through the program overview, I really thought it would be good to give you a bit of history, kind of how we got to where we are with the MAP program and um, the vision that we have for where we want to go. So again, I'm Val Ross, I'm the Director of Programs and Marketing here at the Foundation. Um, and I've been kind of intimately involved with the MAP program for about two years now, almost exactly. And um, I'm proud to say, I think I'm right, uh, that this may be our longest standing grant. I know we have Sam Filler on the line um, as well, who is obviously our executive director. But outside of our New York State funding, I believe the MAP funding um, is our longest standing grant. We've had this grant for 27 years. 
Um, and it's been a pivotal part of our mission, frankly. Um, so we've used this funding to raise the brand profile and the image of New York um, as a quality wine producing region globally. Uh, so it is an exciting program. It is constantly evolving, especially over the last two years. And I would say the last six months more than ever before um, due to some obvious reasons and some other things that we had already been planning. Um, I just wanted to point out a lot of the success from the past 27 years. Um, people ask about the program, like what has it done over this time? And I think a lot of the wins and the successes have been apparent. Uh, wineries from at least three of our major wine growing regions are represented and important and are imported into really important uh, international markets. Um, Hong Kong, London, Ontario, uh, you know, and, and more. Uh, much success has come from using those funds in a way you might not necessarily see as immediate successes for the program. It includes things like education of trade and media, just the general raising of awareness about New York wines that we do exist and produce quality wines of a, you know, distinct uh, style and nature. Also, it helps us create educated partners and international champions and influencers um, who love New York wines and are able to speak about our regions. Um, and we're also able to leverage the USDA funds to engage with press or update our own educational materials, microsites, our website, marketing materials, and our own brand. Um, and now, as you may have seen, a couple press releases come out over the past two days. It's going to be helping us embark on a global messaging campaign. So that's kind of where we were. I'm going to just touch briefly on where we're going. Uh, for the first 25 years of the export program, many of you know, uh, it was managed internally by foundation staff, primarily Susan Spence and Jim Treesice, who did an amazing job um, with a very complex program. And as Sam and I came on to spearhead the program's kind of next iteration, we knew we had a lot to learn. Uh, so we enlisted the help of some longtime export program participants, and you're going to talk to at least one of them today. I think Kelby Russell is going to join us today to talk to you about their experience at Red Newt with the program. We created a pretty robust advisory committee. We engaged with some expert consultants in each of our target markets. Um, and I should say our target markets are decided each and every program year by you, our wineries and program participants. Um, but we spent a long time learning about each market, and we kind of discovered that each market needs a very specialized and nuanced approach. Not all markets are created the same or equal. They have different challenges and opportunities. And we really started to find that that expert guidance um, helping us implement our activities was extremely critical. Um, so that was the first thing that we learned. The second thing that we got from those in-market experts is that we need to start speaking with one voice, uh, a powerful voice and consistently about who we are as a wine producing region. If we're gonna help others understand where we fit into the global picture of wine producing regions and quality wine producing regions, we have to start messaging that appropriately and consistently and powerfully. So we're able to take some map funds, um, again, as you may have seen, um, to prioritize a global messaging campaign. Uh, we're gonna talk about this later in um, some pretty good detail so we can answer some questions that you might have about the press release you just saw about our partnership with Padilla. Uh, but the project's going to make sure that we're consistently and impactfully speaking about New York wines um, and our different regions. So kind of where we wanna go. Um, the third big thing I think that we learned was that running the export program at a high level requires additional kind of compliance, logistics, um, activity management assistance. So we knew we needed some help. Uh, we recently engaged the assistance of Bryant Christie International. This is a firm whose entire mission and expertise really does lie in developing these global markets for products like ours. They've spent 25 years working with MAP uh, funded organizations like California, Washington, and Oregon. So they're very familiar with US wine regions um, and they've worked really successfully with them to implement international marketing activities. So we're extremely excited to be working with Brian Christie and our contact there, our partner there really is Sarah Gelpi, who many of you have already met or have been connected to. She's the assistant director of market development from Brian Christie. And I would say in the past three to four months, she's become an integral member of our export team. 
um, as we're really changing a lot and we're kind of leading the program into its next phase of growth. Sarah is going to be the one to talk to you in more detail now about the recent program successes, um, some of the required elements of participation, uh, questions that you might have as winery participants or new participants, uh, give you a little overview of our international team of experts and provide some more information on our 2020 target markets and some of the activities we already know that we're going to be doing. Um, I did just also want to make a note. I, I it would be remiss if I didn't mention again that Sam is on the line, Sam Filler, our executive director, along with Robert Ketchen, I believe, who is our partner and our expert in market consultant in Ontario. So I didn't know if Sam wanted to say a few words. I know we're all going to be here to answer questions along the way, and we're happy to chime in and provide background. Um, anything that we can do to help you make the decision whether or not to explore exporting opportunities for your wineries, we're, we're all here to help you with that. So. With that, I guess I will either hand it over to Sam and or Sarah. I just want to say hi to everyone. Thank you, Val, for that wonderful introduction. I think you kind of hit hit the nail on the head that um, you know there there was a wonderful history of this program that Jim and Susan developed, and uh, we're sort of building off of that platform that they created and um, bringing you know professional help from. BCI and and then um, just the the great um, uh, representatives we have in our target markets and happy to have Robert on the call as well. Um, you know, I it uh, I think the export program always gets people kind of in a little bit of a mental pretzel because uh, you know obviously we still have a lot of work to do domestically to expand the market uh, access and penetration of New York wines. Um, but if you read my press sec message on Wednesday, I think, you know, we want to be an international wine region. And so we got to walk and chew gum like we're, you know, we're part of, we're in the big league with everyone else. And this investment from USDA is really critical to us being able to have that recognition on the world stage. Um, you know, certainly uh, there's a lot of challenges to exporting wine, but, you know, I'm, I think we've had a lot of recent success, at least in the media in the UK. And, you know, that I think just adds to our reputation. And so whether or not, you know, your particular brand has benefited from, you know, that press, I think in general, you know, the more that New York wines are talked about in the international media and, you know, influential psalms across the world are talking about New York wines, it really raises the boat for everyone. And, you know, we, we really need to stay I think engage in the international scene because that will also pay dividends in the domestic markets that we're looking to activate more and have a larger presence. So I'm really, I want to thank you all for taking the time to learn about the export program. And, um, you know, I think uh, we have some really some exciting things to discuss today and I uh, hope you consider uh, joining us as we, you know, continue to, you know, bang the drum for New York wines across the world. Thanks, Sam and Val, for that great introduction. Um, I'm really excited to uh, be speaking with all of you today and to tell you a bit about the export program and how you all can get involved. Um, just to provide a brief overview of what we will cover today, uh, we will take a little bit of a look at the market access program and touch on uh, what this program is and how the foundation taps into it um, and what the requirements are, as well as uh, some of the recent wins coming out of the program year that we just wrapped up, the 2019-2020 program year. Uh, we'll provide you with the basics about the export program, uh, what you can expect should you participate, um, how you can get involved, and then a look at the uh, activity plans for this program year, uh, which just got kicked off in the last week or so. Uh, then, as Val mentioned, we have Kelby on the line to speak to his experience with the program um, and uh, provide some insights to those of you who might be newer to exporting or are not quite sure how to, to take advantage of these opportunities through the foundation. So. We'll provide an opportunity for questions at the end. Uh, if you have questions in the meantime, feel free to send them across via the chat and we'll try to uh, get to those as best as we can throughout the webinar. 
So uh, just as Val said, uh, this is your export program team, not only Val at the foundation, but now BCI uh, is a part of that team and we're very excited to be on board. Uh, we will be helping the foundation's international representatives in its key targeted markets with the overall uh, implementation and strategic planning of the program and activities. So uh, we have Robert Ketchen from Ketchen Marketing who represents the foundation in Canada. Uh, he is actually on the line today as Valentin mentioned and may be able to chime in uh, if there's anything that I miss related to the Canada program plans. We also have uh, Matthew McFetridge from FLX International who represents the foundation in Asia. And then more recently, we have the Think Drink Global team, Eleanor Standen from RNR. Uh, this is our newest in-market representative firm, and we're really excited about uh, taking the Western Europe program uh, even deeper into Europe with the Think Drink Global team's uh, support there. So, uh, like I said, to start, we thought it would be beneficial to tell you a little bit about the Market Access Program, which is the primary funding source of the Foundation's export program. Uh, the program or MAP as we call it is an export market development grant which U.S. agricultural trade associations can apply for and receive funding to conduct international marketing and promotional activities. Uh, ultimately, the goal is to increase exports of those U.S. ag products um, to international markets. And so this grant program provides groups with funding to share the cost of promotion and really just remain competitive uh, with other ag producing countries. So while participants are required to promise a 10% match of cash or in-kind contributions, many groups contribute substantially more as this is an important consideration for uh, funding allocations. For the 2020 program year, which as I said, just got started, uh, the foundation has been allocated over $470,000 to conduct activities that benefit the New York wine industry. Um, due to the COVID-19 situation impacting the latter part of the 2019 program, we will also be able to supplement the program with rollover funding um, from the year prior. So we have some flexibility there and some additional funds that weren't utilized in 2019. Um, usually it's a, you don't use it, you lose it situation, but in this case, USDA has recognized the unique circumstances that everyone is facing. And so we're thankful uh, to have that funding to utilize to enhance what we have planned uh, this year. In terms of program participants, right now we have about 20 people signed up already um, and we expect several more to join in the next week or so. Um, for 2020, the foundation is targeting uh, Western Europe, Canada, and the Asia Pacific region. Um, and each of these markets were determined to be priority markets by participants and the foundation's export advisory committee. So a bit more history for you here about the foundation's participation in the MAP program. Uh, the foundation is a longtime participant and has had the program directly managed by staff in the Export Advisory Committee. And so new this year, like Val mentioned, uh, the firm that I work for, uh, Bryant Christie Inc. or BCI, has come on board to assist with the management and implementation of the program. Um, and so we're really looking forward uh, to this partnership and have already appreciated um, the opportunity to, to work with you all and to get to know you all as an organization, as an industry. Um, so while we'll manage a lot of the day-to-day -day and work very closely with the international consultants, we'll also work very closely with Val and Sam um, and the Export Advisory Committee and the board who will still ultimately oversee the program and all of the related outcomes. So 
A bit more context here about the foundation's MAP participation. Uh, we felt it was important to mention to you all the strong utilization rate of 92.5%. Uh, you can see that uh, since 1993, the foundation has received over $7 million and expensed about 6.6 .6 million of that. Um, and that utilization rate is very important um, to continued funding of the program. The same goes for the contribution match that the foundation has uh, provided in, in cash and in kind contributions to the program. Uh, so you can see that since 1997, uh, it's been about a 52% match rate. Um, and so as the MAP program becomes more competitive in terms of different groups wanting to take advantage of these funds, the strong utilization rate and uh, contribution rate show commitment to the program and skin in the game. Uh, and so generally, as I mentioned to start, a lot of groups uh, recognize this and are and therefore are contributing substantially to uh, their programs and so uh, this is something that we want to continue to show that the foundation is doing um, and in terms of the utilization rate uh, this 92.5 percent is particularly good in that uh, USDA is concerned with just making sure that groups are expending approximately 80% or more of their funds. And if you're not, they will look to uh, take those funds and see where others might be able to utilize them. So I think the foundation is proud of both its uh, utilization and contributions just in terms of uh, supporting continued funding allocations uh, for the New York wine industry and programming to benefit it. Um, the program year, the last thing I'll mention here is just that the program year runs on a July to June basis. So we just wrapped up 2019-20 and kicked off uh, the 2020 program, which will go through the June of next year. So funding is provided to the foundation for generic programming. And that means that a minimum of two wineries must participate and benefit from any activity that the foundation is implementing. Um, there are opportunities for individual uh, companies to take advantage of promoting their own brand via the market access programs branded program. Um, that is something that a state regional trade group, Food Export Northeast, implements. And they typically solicit their applications in the early fall. And so uh, while certainly the programming that the foundation puts on is great in terms of promoting New York wines generally, and there are opportunities that feature uh, your brands as a part of that, uh, if there are folks that are interested in additional uh, support for your brand and supporting your own marketing. Uh, food export is a, a great resource and we'll be happy to share more information about the branded program. It, should that be something that you all are interested in taking advantage of. So to give you a sense of some of the activities that are eligible uh, for market access program funding, uh, travel to trade shows, uh, as well as other in-market activities uh, are important activities, as well as the funding of in-market trade representatives and any market research that we might need to conduct to get a better sense of uh, market conditions for New York wines in a particular market. Um, in general, most activities that are promotional in nature are eligible through this program. There are restrictions such as, uh, you know, you can't pay for product samples via the program. There are limitations to the types of travel that can be uh, reimbursed. But in general, there, uh, there are a wide range of promotional activities that the foundation is able to implement through utilizing this funding. And so we'll talk in a little bit more detail about what those activities are that uh, we've been doing and that are planned for uh, the current program year, surely. 
So while at the end of the 2019 program year, uh, the programming was impacted by the COVID-19 situation, the foundation really remained nimble and was able to execute a number of activities in its targeted markets uh, through press and media coverage, as well as virtual tasting opportunities. So uh, some of the recent program wins included a set of winemaker features with the buyer and Harper's in the UK, which detailed the history of several New York wineries, including Osmode, Red Newt, Herman J. Weimer, and others. And so that was really positive and increased the awareness and visibility of New York wines um, in an important market, the UK. Um, in Canada, New York wines were released for the first time in many years at the LCBO, uh, featuring wines from eight different wineries. Uh, as a part of a dedicated New York destination collection. And while the activity, uh, you know, certainly experienced its challenges with the COVID-19 situation evolving and presenting uh, many challenges with uh, the Liquor Control Board and uh, getting product out to customers, uh, it's been a, a positive to have those wines be available in the Canadian market and to further promote them via Wine Align and uh, do some tasting opportunities with their staff to create a lot of content that can be utilized going forward to uh, promote in Canada. In terms of other opportunities, uh, there was a webinar conducted in the UK, which included Kelby, who's on the call today, to discuss uh, opportunities uh, from New York and uh, the New York varietals that we have available um, and it, it included a, a panel of important trade and media um, and provided some excellent visibility uh, for the wine, the New York wine industry, as did uh, a feature in Skyward, the Japan Airlines magazine earlier this year in January. So. Uh, this just provides a snapshot of some of the coverage that was recently generated internationally for New York wines. Um, and uh, this type of coverage is very important to just getting the word out to prominent trade and media about New York wine as a region and uh, getting people familiarized with uh, the wine styles and wine production techniques. Um, that can really help us to further our goal of increasing exports to these important target markets. So uh, now we come to how you can get involved. Uh, in terms of the export program, it's available to any New York winery um, and the fees are dependent on how many markets you select to participate in. There's not a deadline to sign up, but we do encourage anyone who is interested to sign up very uh, early in the program year to take full advantage of what we have planned. Uh, we expect that we'll be doing some uh, consolidated wine shipments soon, uh, which will be a key starting point for many of our activities. And so uh, signing up early on will ensure that you're able to take part in that and have your wines featured in these international markets. Um, so some of the activities planned for this year include uh, online webinars. Uh, we have international consultants that are able to meet one-on-one -on -one and discuss uh, any questions or concerns you might have. Uh, we also have reverse trade missions planned should uh, travel. We're hoping travel will be possible again sometime early uh, in the spring part of next year, uh, as well as trade shows and other activities, both in person and virtual, including master classes and other activities targeting trade and media. You can sign up online at this link. Um, it'll take you to a 
a survey here via survey gizmo and uh, we just ask for some information regarding uh, your winery uh, as well as the, the head winemaker, uh, whether you're represented internationally already, uh, which markets of interest are of interest to you, and uh, whether you're interested in serving on the export advisory committee, which we would encourage everyone to do. Um, so if you haven't already, uh, please do go online and sign up, uh, should this be something that you're interested in uh, pursuing. In terms of what you can expect uh, beyond the normal, uh, sorry, beyond the uh, the fee to participate in the activities, you're also expected uh, to contribute your your time to uh, participate in these activities as well as samples, uh, so that people can try New York wines. And so this uh, is necessary for both in person and virtual engagements that we have planned. So as an example, uh, we will, like I said, be putting out a, a call to uh, To put together some wine shipments in the coming weeks and uh, that'll really drive our programming in Asia, for example, in in the fall, uh, but we'll as we also look to do virtual uh, activities such as seminars on New York wines, uh, we will look to uh, winemakers to come on and uh, present about New York wines as a region. And so uh, we really uh, appreciate that involvement of all participants because uh, you all are able to speak to the wine uh, region and varietals in a way that really resonates with trade and media. Um, and so that is a key consideration um, that you should keep in mind when deciding whether to participate. Uh, in addition, you may also be asked to provide uh, success stories coming out of the program, or if you're uh, like Kelby, you might be asked to participate in a webinar uh, overviewing the program. Um, and this really helps us uh, not only to speak to uh, new people who might be interested in the program, but also the success stories are really important for continued USDA funding. And so uh, we are regularly asked to provide success stories to USDA to show them uh, how the funding has been utilized by the New York Wine and Grape Foundation and how uh, individual New York wineries have benefited from that. Um, and so uh, that's something as well to consider. Um, Let's see here. So yeah, if you've already given a, a verbal commitment, you still do need to fill out the online survey form. Um, and this is important to collect some of the information that I mentioned uh, previously. We'll also ask uh, you to categorize your winery as one of the following uh, explorers, experienced, recognized, or established. Um, and so you know, explorers might be wineries that are newer to the program and newer to exporting in general, uh, whereas experienced wineries may have participated before but still need some guidance in terms of how to make best use of uh, some of the opportunities like trade shows and tastings. Recognized wineries uh, in a lot of cases have winemakers or wines that are already recognized in uh, key international markets um, and the program can help with uh, brand further brand recognition efforts um, and then established wineries uh, are already you know pretty heavily engaged in exporting and uh, have representation in the market but regardless of where you fit within this spectrum i think that uh, there's a place for all wineries within the foundation's uh, export program. There's something that everybody can take advantage of regardless of what stage you're in. But for us, it's helpful to know where you fit within this scale uh, to help guide you into the opportunities that are most appropriate uh, for your winery. There are opportunities to travel. And so while it's still unclear when travel will be possible or when people will be comfortable traveling again, uh, there are travel opportunities that come up as a part of the program to attend trade shows or other uh, 
activities such as tastings or seminars. And so uh, the foundation will again uh, subsidize travel for wineries at 100%. Uh, we just ask that representatives who do travel will be asked to speak on New York wines as uh, or New York as a wine region and educate on the varietals and wine styles uh, from a generic perspective rather than focused on uh, the individual winery that you represent. Uh, so before I move on to the 2020 marketing plan, I just wanted to give Val or Sam the opportunity to chime in with anything that I may have uh, missed here. Do, is there anything you'd like to add, Val? Um, no, that was great, Sarah. The only other thing I wanted to make a comment on, and I think this goes for all wineries or could be a benefit for any of the wineries in any of those categories is that because working with you, we're able to really build up our website to have some educational materials. So market reports, um, we're hoping to roll out potentially even an export participant newsletter that keeps you connected with everything that's going on in the target market. So trends, things that you need to be aware of, maybe even educational, you know, articles, the difference between, you know, X works and FOB pricing and things that people ask all the time. I think that what we've learned now is just like a baseline level of capacity building for, for all of the winery participants is going to be something that we need to do. Um, and so I think with the additional assistance of Brian Christie's, we've already loaded up probably 15 or 20 market reports to our, our website uh, for everybody to take a look at. That's just one of the things that we want to do this year in addition to all of the activities. So helping wineries educate themselves about this type of kind of adding this to their business model um, is really important. Yeah, thanks Val. That's a, a great point and definitely something that we're looking to uh, work with you all to strengthen even further. Um, we do also have a question here Val that uh, you might be able to answer better. Uh, we have somebody asking, can you share a bit more on the amount of product required? So. From my perspective, I think it depends on the type of activity we're talking about, but Val perhaps yeah. can speak to this. Yeah, it does. And Sarah's going to go over the marketing activities. And usually we have quite a few large scale trade shows that we engage in anywhere from two to three per year. And wineries are asked to submit um, kind of four bottles of each SKU that they want to have featured at the trade show. So you can have three or four different bottles of wine. So it may be up to a case of wine per trade show. If you engage in three trade shows at three cases of wine, plus additional um, kind of curated or, or high touch events with influencers or psalms in each market. So that's an additional up to a case or a case and a half of each wine um, if you are asked to participate in those. So it could be anywhere from kind of three to maybe five cases if you're heavily engaged in the program. Um, I think this year we're only going to be doing one large scale trade show, but we are going to really be focusing on getting samples into the market. So I still think that might be a safe estimate. Um, and I don't know, relatively speaking, whether that's a lot or not. Uh, yeah, thank you, Val. That's sure. helpful. All right, I have just a few more slides on the program for this year uh, before I turn it over to Kelby to speak to his experience. So let's look at what we have planned here. Um, I mentioned earlier that the foundation has about $474,000 with some rollover funding available. Uh, the current budget breakdown is split as you see here on the screen uh, with a large portion of the budget going towards an expanded Western Europe program. Um, this also does include the ProWine uh, trade show, uh, which is a, a big, bigger budget item. Um, Asia and the global markets comprise about 20% of the budget, followed by Canada at 16%. So of note, uh, Canada is also supplemented by funding from another USDA grant program, the Agricultural Trade Program, which I'll touch on a bit um, in, a, in a couple slides. And so that, that is not included as a part of this breakdown. It's a separate funding bucket. 
Uh, we also have a small contingency available for the Americas uh, and are in the process of identifying opportunities there to leverage uh, partnerships with USDA uh, to tap into some lower cost opportunities to support those wineries who are interested in, uh, in pursuing that region of the world. So what's new in 2020? Uh, the foundation plans to participate in one key trade show, Provine, uh, in March of 2021. Uh, in addition, we're working with a new representative and uh, have plans for an expanded program in the Western European market to target other markets beyond the UK. And so some auxiliary activities uh, will be planned around the Provine trade show. Uh, digital activities will be a bigger part of the program uh, as necessitated by uh, COVID-19 and uh, travel restrictions. So we'll continue to think creatively and adapt programming as needed, uh, depending on the situation. But we already have some exciting digital elements uh, planned uh, to start this fall. So uh, we're looking forward to kicking some of the, those things off pretty soon. Um, in addition, as a part of a, another ongoing project via the global budget uh, is the development of new marketing and educational uh, assets and tools. And so I'll, I'll touch a bit more on that in a moment. Looking to uh, Asia, the, the foundation's program in Asia is focused on uh, Japan, China, and Hong Kong. So about 50% of what is allocated to uh, Asia will be concentrated on programming in Japan, which is a relatively new focus for the foundation. Um, we're planning on working with key importers in the market, as well as Matthew, uh, our Asia representative, to carry out activities such as visits with the on-trade to provide uh, curated tasting opportunities, as well as seminars, uh, dinners, and SOM trainings. The COVID situation in China has actually improved substantially compared to the US and other countries, uh, whereas Japan might be more impacted uh, lately, and Hong Kong is a bit of an unknown because of the political situation. So these factors will drive what it's what is possible for us to implement this year. So uh, we're in the process of fleshing out more fully what virtual engagements are possible, but the important first step will be to uh, get some wine over to the market. Um, and so we'll be soliciting that in the coming weeks. Assuming travel is possible, we plan to bring a delegation of buyers to the Finger Lakes in the spring or summer, uh, potentially in, in conjunction with the FL excursion um, that uh, has taken place in the past in the summer period. Uh, apologize, I'm gonna kind of go quickly here because I do wanna allow some time for Kelby to speak. I think that will be important for you all to hear from him. Um, in Canada, the focus will be to continue to sell the wines that are available via the LCBO and capitalizing on the momentum from 2019. Um, we will be in year two of the ATP project, which is a collaborative project that is uh, being spearheaded by the foundation um, and includes all uh, U.S. wine regions. Uh, there's about $300,000 available for the U.S. wine regions to feature U.S. wines with the LCBO via destination collection online and uh, special stores. Um, and so this program will continue with a second New York, uh, New York release uh, planned, uh, hopefully in the spring of 2021. But in the meantime, we are uh, promoting online with Wine Align, as well as the LCBO and others. Uh, we've just discussed another partnership with, uh, I believe it's Good Food Revolution. Robert can chime in if I'm, uh, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong there. But uh, as, uh, some of those things uh, will take place. And as Canada continues with its gradual reopening, we are looking to do some outdoor uh, pop-up tastings 
Um, and similar to Asia, it'll be important to get buyers and SOMs over to New York. So we're hoping to uh, do a reverse trade mission in the spring as well. Sarah, can I add a little color to reverse trade missions? Yes. Because um, I know in the last slide, as it related to Asia, we specifically called out that we would bring them to the Finger Lakes. And I just, I know we have some folks on the line here from Long Island or the Hudson Valley, and you may be like, well, why aren't they coming to my region? I'm part of the program. Uh, in those, in, you know, I think in those instances where we're bringing them to a very targeted and specific activity, like Apple Excursion, um, you know, what we have done is we've done walk around tastings that include all the participants in the export program that want to send wines and even send representatives. So, um, you know, when FL Excursion happened last summer, we did a tasting at um, uh, Fox Run Vineyards and we had uh, a table for Long Island wines and we had a table for Hudson Valley wines. And I think some representatives may have come up to help present them. So, um, you know, just because we're bringing a group to a specific area of the state doesn't mean that you'll be left out. Um, you know, there's also uh, in partnership with the California Sustainable Wine Growing Association, they're bringing their second annual U.S. Wine Sustainability Conference to Long Island, uh, April 2021. And so, you know, we haven't made a commitment yet to do a reverse trade mission, but, you know, big events like that are, you know, really great opportunities to bring trade and uh, be part of kind of a bigger event, but also give them a high touch opportunity. Uh, and then, you know, for those of you who've participated in New York Drinks New York, uh, we've used the grand tasting as an opportunity again to bring international buyers in. And, and part of the work that we've done in the past is, is what led to this opportunity in Canada with the LCBO. Their, their top uh, category buyer from the Americas came down last year and it really kind of kicked off this, you know, new energy and focus in, in Ontario. So, um, sorry for the, the long explanation, but the bottom line is, is if you're a participant in the export program, you know, we're going to make sure that, you know, there's an opportunity for your wines to be featured in, uh, you know, these, these kind of high touch unique opportunities. Thank you, Sam. Yes, that's really important uh, to clarify. All right, uh, in the interest of time, I'll move on here to Western Europe. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the program in the Western Europe region is expanding. So whereas the focus in the past has been primarily on the UK and uh, some key trade shows, this year we are more, uh, we're integrating more of activities in other markets or to include uh, trade and media from other markets in Europe, such as Germany, France, uh, Ireland, as well as markets in Scandinavia. So to kick things off, monthly seminars are planned to start in the fall, uh, monthly online seminars, I should say, uh, which will target trade and media in each of these key countries that I've just mentioned. Uh, they'll be hosted by key influencers that are champions of New York wines um, and will include relevant themes that explore New York as a wine region, as well as New York uh, wines and their uh, pairings with food and uh, a lot of other great content planned. So we'll also look to uh, involve wineries here to come on and to speak to uh, you know, your own wineries and New York uh, as, a, as a region. So this will be some, an opportunity for people to get engaged um, in the Western Europe region. In, uh, in terms of other activities, Provine will be a cornerstone event with activities planned around it, including uh, a tasting and uh, a tasting opportunity in Copenhagen and uh, London preliminarily are, are targeted. We are also targeting uh, or also discussing, I should say, what our contingency options are should the show not go forward for any region, uh, any reason. So beyond this, uh, similar to the other markets, you'll notice a common theme. We want to get buyers over to New York to uh, meet with as many wineries as possible. And so we are planning uh, some br on bringing over some buyers and media influencers uh, over um, and are targeting some of the similar 
uh, activities in New York as uh, good opportunities to do that. Um, in addition to that, we'll have ongoing uh, press management and uh, trade servicing. So we want to make sure that we have a resource for uh, wineries that are interested in exploring questions or concerns, especially as they relate to logistical challenges and just uh, getting uh, in touch with the right people in Europe to begin exporting your wine. So we want to utilize our uh, new representative company uh, in in Western Europe to help with some of those issues. I want to just add again a little more color. I know we had mentioned access to research reports and maybe I, I geek out a little bit too much on this because Val and I have to dive deep into market analysis reports and we incorporate that into our um, grant application proposal to USDA to justify the markets we'll be in. But Western Europe is very fascinating. Uh, I'm sure as you're you know, it's every country is a little bit different. And so, you know, this is where I think, you know, if you if you get engaged with the export program, you should dive into these reports too. And I'll just highlight, you know, USDA did a special report on Norway and Norway wine consuming habits and Norwegians love bag in the box red wines that they can have every night with their meal. And uh, they like statements on sustainability and how you take good care of your vineyard. So, um, you know, I'm just sharing that as like, uh, there's some really interesting nuances to the Western European market. And so, you know, I think that there's a place for a variety of wine styles and packaging formats that are available from New York that, you know, while maybe the UK is not the right market for you, you may find success in Scandinavia or the Netherlands. So um, it's a really fascinating place. And I would encourage you to, you know, just dig into some of these research reports that we can share with you. Thank you, Sam. All right, uh, lastly here, before I turn it over to Kelby, we have an ongoing uh, global messaging project. Um, and this is something that is carrying over from the 2019 program year. Um, but this initiative will uh, be to further deploy the newly developed uh, Boldly New York brand. And so we're working with a consultant team, uh, Padilla, I know some of them are on the line today, uh, to define uh, New York wine archetypes, uh, trade and media audiences, who are the people uh, that we should be reaching and have them recommend uh, key messages for New York wines and really hone in on uh, a strategic marketing plan. Um, in fact, the key deliverable is really a strategic 24-month uh, uh, multi-channel marketing approach uh, that'll be split um, into, you know, year one and year two activations. And so uh, this global messaging project is really going to provide us with a, a strong foundation, not only for the international program, but also for uh, the foundation's programs more broadly. And so we're looking to get uh, some great resources as well out of this, um, including revamping some of the marketing assets and educational assets uh, that speak best to uh, New York wine uh, trade and media audiences. Um, and so we're working with the Padilla team um, through the fall to, uh, to have this foundation in place for the foundation. Uh, to move forward with its programming. Val or Sam, is there anything you want to add about uh, this project and our uh, how it's coming along? No, I think we should really turn it over to Kelby. I, I am assuming that we're going to have some more of these kind of online sessions throughout the year. And as we kind of go through the process, we're going to be uh, engaging with you guys and letting you know where we are. So uh, happy to share that as, they, uh, as the milestones get met. Great. Alrighty, well, without further delay here, uh, we'll turn it over to Kelby, who's on the line to provide his perspective about how wineries can engage in the program and make the most out of it. Um, Kelby is the head winemaker at Red Newt Cellars and Finger Lakes and has participated in the program for several years now. So Kelby, uh, we'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, I'm uh, really pleased to be able to to chime in here and uh, provide some, uh, I don't know, a success story and also just uh, 
uh, experience of, of dealing with the export market and uh, the benefits of working with the export market using all the resources the Wine and Grape Foundation offers. Uh, so Red Newt has been uh, a participant in the program, uh, I want to say since maybe 2013 or 2014, the exact date I'm not, uh, I can't entirely remember, uh, but around the same time that we uh, decided that export was something we wanted to look at. Uh, and it's not necessarily something that uh, is right for every winery. Uh, and when you start out, it's quite intimidating to think which wine markets you might want to in, uh, investigate or, or what your goals are, especially if you're a, a relatively small winery that already has sales channels for most of what you make. Uh, but, you know, I think one of the great things about these, this programming is that the barrier to entry is really quite minimal uh, in terms of a, a cost to, to to at least dip your toe in the water. So we decided to do that uh, and decided to explore a few different markets uh, in that first run, I think uh, primarily Western European markets uh, in connection with uh, New York wines, uh, the, the import company uh, that was, was set up around that same time. Uh, and we kind of piggybacked on that, decided to see uh, what would come of it. Uh, it was, uh, I really like the way that the, the foundations or the questionnaire goes in terms of asking you to describe what sort of export participant you are, because it really maps on nicely to what Red Newt went through and what I, what I saw us uh, kind of evolve through as we started out. We started out not knowing what uh, markets we necessarily wanted to be in or what it even took to export, uh, but uh, we're intrigued, intrigued enough to give it a chance. Uh, and through the foundation's programming really started to get a sense of what those export markets look like and what they're looking for. Uh, and we're able to see areas within our own portfolio or with our own, within our own production where we could really line up with those, uh, line those two things up and pursue them. Uh, so I think uh, maybe that's, uh, I know it's a, it's, a, it's a great way of thinking about it because I think you can become intimidated with uh, well, I need to know what my objective is coming into an export program. Uh, and at this point, you know, we've been doing this for a handful of years and we have ideas every year of what we're hoping to achieve in the export market. But it's also okay the first year or the first couple of years to say, I don't know what my objectives should be. Like, what is, what's the range of potential outcomes that I should even consider? Uh, and, and going into it and using the resources available and getting feedback from the markets, which is huge uh, and crucial, and figure out uh, what what seems like a reasonable move for you next. Um, I think we've seen a bit of a shift over the last few years from uh, trade shows and major trade shows uh, towards more uh, finely tuned or finely tailored programming in the export market. Uh, I think that's something that, that the Wine and Grape Foundation has done. I think it's something maybe largely speaking that people are doing. Uh, you know, a large show like Provine uh, is a great place to get exposure for, for New York wines, uh, but it's also a hard one to really make a, a distinct splash in. Uh, and a lot of the tastemakers that we want to, to really reach out to and connect with and, and show New York wines to, they're on such a tight schedule and on such a circuit as they're running around these trade shows that it's, it's almost uh, hard to break through. So I think the, the reverse trade missions, I think, have been a great uh, uh, initiative that I think has really come along in the last few years. Uh, I think the sort of pitching things to specific buyers or to specific magazines and getting features and, and getting outreach to particular sets of people that will then become ambassadors for New York wines. I think we've seen a huge amount of pull through because of that. Uh, and it's something that uh, anytime I see a request come through for wine or for assistance in a in an interview or anything along those lines, we make sure to, to help out with uh, as, as much as we can. I think uh, the other thing is I've been reflecting on Red Newt's participation in the export program since we started in it. Uh, in, I think my first trade trip was probably the London Wine Fair in 2014. Uh, and I think what really makes it successful both for the brand and for New York uh, is it's incredibly important to go into the market feeling comfortable and being ready to represent uh, New York wines as a whole. Uh, 
uh, you're obviously there uh, as a as an employee or as an owner of a particular brand, uh, but I can't tell you how much more valuable it is to the whole export program and eventually to yourself to to speak to the wines in general uh, and to speak to the whole the whole spread of whether it's uh, you know whether you're kind of manning a Finger Lake side of a of a big show booth or uh, in the the most recent trip I had to the UK where we were talking about New York wines writ large, uh, so not just my own home region but everything. Um, feeling comfortable and and not even comfortable, feeling enthusiastic about speaking to those. Uh, you know, I think of myself truly as a as an ambassador for New York wines when I'm out uh, in the marketplace, and I think that's been. Uh, one of the reasons that it's been a successful thing for for Red Newt as well, because that's just a a great attitude to take. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm, I have like my bureaucratic hat on when I think about these things as well. And anytime we have a chance to to show how well New York wines work together and play together, uh, I think it, it's a, a positive for the the map funding uh, down the line as well when we're when we're reaching out to. Uh, ambassadors and various consulates and, and showing how well we play together. Uh, I don't want to take too much time because uh, I know there'll be time for questions. Uh, I think if uh, I was going to talk to someone who's new in the export uh, market or thinking about the export market and whether they should join, uh, it's intimidating, uh, I think. Uh, and I would encourage everyone to, to not let that intimidation get in the way of participating because once you get into it, uh, there's no better way to get to find out what, what you need to do than to actually just take a chance. You can't really tell from the outside. Uh, and I think we all do ourselves a bit of a disservice when we think, oh, exporting is so scary. How do I, how do, I do this? How do I find access to markets? When uh, as a quirk of how the United States is set up, especially post prohibition, we're all exporting in exporting to some extent if you've ever had to deal with a different state uh, and shipping to a different state or working with a distributor in a different state and finding new partners uh, you know finding an export partner and working in an export market is a little more complicated than uh, working in a different state with a new distributor but it's probably only 10% more difficult than it actually is to find that uh, than any any domestic market change would be. And I think that's something to keep in mind if it feels intimidating is that really uh, we've all experienced this just in our normal day-to-day -day life uh, and it's a, a chance to spread the word of New York wines beyond our own, our own borders. I mean, actually, if I'm being really honest, I think it's probably easier for us to sell wine to, you know, Western Europe than it is for us to sell wine in California right now, uh, which is quite the head scratcher, uh, but it's, it, you know, sometimes you don't know where opportunity is going to pop up. Uh, and this program allows you to, to not only find it, but then uh, really seize it and, and make the most of it. Thank you so much, Kelby. I think all of that is great information uh, for people to have who are considering uh, joining the program and understanding how uh, you in particular and Red Nude have uh, taken advantage of the program and how it's benefited you. I know you mentioned uh, to me that uh, the importance of selecting the right wines to feature in these markets is something that people should consider. And I, I wondered if you might speak to that for a minute or so. Yeah, I think, uh it's always a moving target. I think what Sam said was really spot on uh, that these markets are varied as well and it can kind of keep you on your toes. I think there is, uh, I know initially looking at Western Europe, there was an idea that going in with our lower price point lines uh, would be the best way to overcome the, the, the expenses that are added when you have to export uh, and where it ends up on the shelf in, in the export market. Uh, but as we got feedback, uh, it turned out that uh, probably where our wines are most competitive is more in the mid and upper tier, where we actually come in below equivalents from, from I don't know, I'm thinking of Riesling as a Riesling winemaker, but you know, top-end German Rieslings in the UK market end up costing more than top-end Rieslings exported from, uh, from the Finger Lakes or from New York State into that market. Uh, so kind of counterintuitively, your most expensive wine might be your most... Uh, might be where you have the competitive advantage. Uh, and I think that's something that we have to learn anew in every market, but I think the, 
the partnerships that we have with uh, with influencers in the markets, and now and now the, the uh, sort of like overarching strategies that we're putting together. It's really important to to sometimes uh, be open to the fact that it might be a little counterintuitive. Uh, uh, and I guess if I, I this might be not as uh, this might be a little more biased. I think the thing I've seen in working markets is. Uh, I know when I would send wine to trade shows, I would try and really diversify the set of wines I would send uh, to make sure that there were like little openings for for things to get shown. You know, make sure I'd send like a Pinot Gris or a Gewurztraminer. Uh, and it, what I, the feedback that we've got in trying to break into a market like the UK is that they really want uh, the message to be a little more simplified. Uh, and I think my sort of natural shyness at, you know, I don't want to send Rieslings if I know my neighbors are sending Riesling. Well, as it turns out, in a new market, when they're trying to understand what is the Finger Lakes about, for example, they do want to try 20 Rieslings in a row. You know, they don't want to try five Rieslings and 15 other mixed bag wines uh, that might all be delicious, but it's harder for them to get their head around it. Uh, and I think, you know, the, the feedback that we're getting from the market and the feedback that the foundation and all of you provide when it's time to select wine, uh, I wouldn't, uh, as a producer, I wouldn't look at any suggestions about what wines I should send as a uh, uh, intrusive, I guess, you know, they're, they're always coming from a place of understanding where the market wants to see something. And I just want to add to, you know, we've, we spent some time in France the past two to three years, which may not seem like the brightest idea because they generally only drink their own domestic wines, but we've attended uh, Vin Expo Bordeaux, Vin Expo, I don't think we did Vin Expo Paris this year, or I think actually that was the last show we went to before uh, COVID Val was out there for that. Um, but, you know, they responded very well to our, our Rieslings and there was uh, some interested buyers. And, um, you know, I, I would also say like that Europe is not so, um, you know, the NIFRA only focus. They're, they're also interested in some of the varieties that are unique to New York. And, uh, you know, for instance, like a Traminette also did well in the UK market as well. Um, but I, but I would echo what Kelby said. It's, it's interesting that uh, I was there with Kelby in the UK in June of 2018, and we went around the city and did a bunch of tastings, and it was really the premium Rieslings that kind of hit the bell with a lot of uh, folks out there. And, um, you know, I think we've done much more market development work, so there's, there's space for other, you know, high quality ones from New York as well. But, um, just the last thing I want to say about like, you know, Kelby keeps talking about it. it's, it's an opportunity for you to test your wines. I think to go back to the point of like, Hey, we're an international wine region and we got to walk and chew gum that way. It's like, you know, this is good feedback just for us to raise the overall quality of our winemaking too, because if we want to play in this space, it's, you know, playing in the, U in London and playing in Paris and, you know, Germany is the same as if we want to be competitive in the, the major cities of the United States too. So it's, I think, uh, a good opportunity just to get the feedback as to where we benchmark in the world order of wines as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point, Sam. I, I didn't think of that, but I remember the first time I had Riesling shown at like a, a, an international Riesling event uh, and uh, feeling, uh, uh, I don't want to say like it, it wasn't uh, up to snuff, but just realizing the, the, the caliber of what uh, things were up against uh, and that, not being disheartening, but like being motivating. Uh, and then a couple years later, uh, my partner Julia had the same experience happen with one of her wines. Uh, and I got to like watch on her face the same sort of uh, reaction happen, which is, I mean, you know, that's the one thing of going into the international market is it will make your wines better, uh, but uh, it can certainly be uh, a bit intimidating once you're suddenly uh, outside like the sheltered cove of uh, New York, the New York market. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kelby, for uh, providing your perspective. I do want, I know we're, we've gone over our allotted hour here, but I do want to allow the opportunity for a few questions if uh, people are interested. Um, I do see we have one come through uh, via the chat about market access program funding uh, resources being allocated to wine competitions abroad. And perhaps Sam might be able to speak better to whether this is something the foundation has done, but just from a 
perspective of whether that's possible, I think certainly MAP funding can be used in that way to support uh, participation in a, a competition, whether that's uh, participation fees or uh, shipping wine over there, um, et, et cetera. Uh, but Sam, yeah, I, I think I think this was uh, it's a good question, and I think it is something that um, Jim and Susan were more proactive on because of Jim's uh, reputation as an international wine judge. Uh, so we we had organized a submission annually to the Canberra uh, competition in Australia. I I don't know. Um, if MAP funds were used for that, this is sort of where, uh, we, you know, on, on our kind of operational end, we, we kind of combine funding streams. So uh, as you're probably aware, through the state funding we receive, we do subsidize wine competitions. And, um, you know, through that program, we haven't been, um, you know, just limited to domestic shows. I think we've helped subsidize international shows. So um, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't know to what extent the past couple of years it hasn't been a strategic um, angle of how we've used the map funds, um, but certainly um, you know we we do underwrite wine competitions. But I think I, I guess I'm trying to answer it from like helping you know strategically using a competition to present New York wines as a category to advance our goals for the maps international marketing program. Um, that I think it's something we can consider, but. There, there are ways if you know you as an individual winery want to get your wines into an international wine competition, that's something that we've supported before. Thanks, Sam. Uh, are there any other questions right now, whether for uh, Sam or I or for Kelby? Um, you can also feel free to uh, email any questions following this uh, session if there are things you think of later. Do we have a few? I have some questions. Feel ahead, Amy. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy. I'm with Lieb Sellers on Long Island. Hi, May. Um, I have to be honest and say that um, I am listening in here um, and I'm trying to be open to the idea of exporting, but um, I do have a lot of reservations because. We have a very clear goal at Leave and Bridge Lane to continue to expand our wholesale footprint domestically. Um, and we've been sort of slowly working our way, you know, down up and down the East Coast and now starting to move west. And I um, am keenly aware of how much work it takes to get set up. I think Kelby, you kind of gave me a little bit more reassurance, but keenly aware of how much work it takes to find a distributor, um, find a good partner, get set up, get all of the compliance set up when we expand into a, into another state. So um, my concern is that that work would be even greater if we were to consider um, some export partners. And I was wondering if, um, we had, just so you guys know, we have had one um, Lieb Sellers in the past. It was, it was an existing relationship before I started here. We, had, we have one experience with export and it was with a um, distributor partner in China. And shortly after I started here, um, we had a situation where we sold a bunch of wine to them and then they never paid us for it. So that's our history on export at the winery. Um, and then I combine that with having sort of fears about compliance, but I was wondering if generally, um, you could illuminate or kind of provide some information on like, um, what type of licensing and setup is required when you're exporting to one of these states? And then also, is there any, um, like how does the, how does the shipping occur? And also, are there any packaging? changes and label changes. I guess this, that is specifically my concern. Label changes that would need to be made to the wine if you're going into some of these other markets. Yeah, I can, I can chime in. There's almost always different uh, label requirements uh, mm -hmm. in going to a different market. Uh, usually for us, that is just meant uh, there's almost these pre-formatted stickers that you can get that you just have to sticker on over uh, 
you know, if it's something that's a, uh, that the target market doesn't want showing, covering it up, uh, and then any, any additional information that they might want. Uh, that's usually something we've taken care of in-house here, as opposed, okay. to, as opposed to the export partner having to deal with that. Uh, although sometimes they'll, they'll just do it themselves. Uh, but it's never been uh, that big of an issue. I mean, it, uh, I think if we ever got to a point where we had to do a ton of it, then that would mean that we were selling enough to just separate labeling. Right. Uh, so um, that, yeah, go ahead. Okay. And um, just in terms of like, if you're, uh, I think you said you were selling in the UK at one point. Um, uh, how much sort of compliance and licensing work was involved with getting to a place where you could actually start selling to a distributor there? Uh, for us, it was very little. I mean, probably less compliance than we have to do for ship for uh, representing ourselves in a different state, uh, oh. which is uh, which is you know surprising for sure. But uh, yes, it was straightforward. Uh, the shipping you brought up shipping that is always a uh, bigger hurdle uh, just because at least right now uh, almost any export partner can figure out how to get the wine to themselves I mean they're usually these companies are uh, you know are experts at importing things into their country but uh, as I think Sam can certainly speak to as well one of the biggest hurdles we face right now is that it costs more for people to I'm thinking of Western Europe but it costs more to export to bring wine from New York State into Western Europe than it does to get it from California just because it's a less right. used uh, uh, channel uh, right uh, so that's always a bit of a a bit of a hassle I think it's probably something that a lot of people are like we are putting our minds to right now because it'd be great if we could find a way to consolidate and, and make that easier but okay um, and then my other general question was just of the 20 or so, I guess, participants, existing participants in this program, how many of them are simply using this program as sort of a way to become, Kelby, like you said, an ambassador for New York wines and just help to sort of get the region exposure and elevate our reputation versus using this program to actually secure, try to secure distributors and sell to these markets? I am. I would say, uh, from my experience working shows, I would say that uh, the people that have been going have always been very good, but have become, uh, I would say, more serious in recent years. Uh, everyone's very good at representing New York State uh, and has been, but I think more people that are on these trade trips are uh, explicitly and kind of actively looking for uh, distribution in the markets uh, or okay. a representative in the market, uh, which is, uh, I think, and I think that's a, a sign, I would say that's a sign of the maturation of New York wines in general in these marketplaces. You know, I think right. for quite a few years, it was just trying to get people to realize we make wine in New York. Uh, so mm -hmm. it wasn't, you know, the idea of finding an importer wasn't even all that uh, likely some sometimes. Uh, whereas now, uh, when you go over, you can actually, uh, if you're uh, making aggressive use of your time or making good use of your time, you should be able to find partners or partners that want to have media talk about things. They might not work out, but they'll be, uh, you know, they're, they're actually there now. Right. Okay. That's good to know. Um, and then my last question is, we get a lot of inquiries um, via email from overseas distributors and they come in, I would say fairly frequently. Um, and it's very difficult for us to sort of vet them um, because we get, you know, an inquiry from Japan, an inqui inquiry from Norway, an inquiry from, you know, all these, uh, all these different, you know, foreign companies. And it's hard to sort of, it's, it's different than being able to vet a distributor in the U.S. where typically we can like go in and, you know, see what suppliers they're representing and then figure out we know one of them and, and talk to them. I'm wondering if, um, if we could also use sort of all of your expertise as a way to help us sort of vet some of these guys who approach us and seem to be very credible and seem to want to buy our wine, but it's, it's very hard for us to sort of take a risk and know 
um, you know, whether or not they would be good partners of ours without being able to kind of um, have, have them give us references or be able to sort of look into them online. Yeah, I know. Well, we, uh, uh, well I was going to say that's our in-market representatives um, can assist you with that um, as they're kind of the boots on the ground. Um, and I, you know, I, Ontario is a very specific market and, you know, Robert, you can chime in if you like, but, you know, I, you know, I had mentioned we brought a group of buyers down from Canada for the last uh, New York Drinks, New York Grand Tasting and, and Robert specifically handpicked a set of distributors that he knew, you know, had the capacity and the expertise to deal with a region like New York. And, and as we advanced in um, having the LCBO decide they were going to do a New York wine category release, you know, each winery went through a vetting process and, uh, and we're lined up with distributors that, you know, we're willing to make the commitment and we're only going to work with the wineries. And so, you know, that, I mean, that it's a very specific and intensive vetting process we went through because just of the nature of the Ontario market. Right. But I think, Kelby, you were probably going to say something about what, you know, I know, I know you worked with Matthew McFetridge, who also kind of helps vet um, consultants out in uh, or, um, importers that are based in Asia. Yeah, exactly. I was going to say we, we've uh, many times over the last few years reached out to uh, whichever uh, boots on the ground person the foundation works with. Uh, for us, that's usually either been in Western Europe or uh, in the Asian market uh, since since uh, Robert did a great job with the, the Ontario supplier or Ontario uh, representatives. Uh, but yeah, we, we get the same thing. We get uh, emails asking us to work with people all the time uh, and, and yeah you're like what is this? like I, half of them are probably like scams <laughs> yeah. and so the, the uh, trade representatives on the ground have been uh, may make short work of uh, sifting through things like that uh, okay very cool take a lot okay. of guest work out thank you and I don't know. I know we have Brian Doretz on the line too, and he specifically uh, imports New York wines to Japan. And I don't know if you want to add any color to some of um, Amy's questions based on your experience with Japan. Well, don't know if he's still listening. Um, and Sam, Sam Robert here. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Robert. Can you hear me? Can yes. You hear me? I think uh, it was, it's already been answered, but I do believe the most important thing you'll ever do is get the right distributor agent. Uh, that is absolutely important that your advisor on. Well, Robert, you went on mute. Find the right agent because in the end, higher is going to rely on that distributor. The buyer's going to trust that distributor and it's a relationship. There's a three-way relationship. It's hugely important to get it right. And you're right to say those emails coming into you, people soliciting, very tempting. They, a lot of them promise the world. Um, I wouldn't touch them uh, until you're really ready to go into that market and go to that trade fair and work with the market representative to find the right agent for your brand knowing that they have a track record, knowing they've got relationships already in place with the buyers, with the retailers. Here we go. Thanks, Robert. All right. Uh, I don't want to cut the discussion short, uh, but if there are any further questions, I think it would probably be best if we address those as follow-up. Um, so I see there's one question about Asia uh, Pacific. So uh, we'll follow up on that via email. And if any others come to mind, I believe all of you should have my contact information. Uh, please do feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm happy to be a resource for you uh, as well as connect you with our in-market consultant teams if there are questions that are better uh, posed to them. Uh, Sam, uh, and I, I actually would like to answer that question just before okay. we close, which is, um, you know, it, it is a significant sum of uh, grant funding that we receive from USDA. But when you begin to carve it up that based on market, it's, it's, you know, at the end of the day, not a lot of funding to, um, I think, have impactful uh, 
programming. And so in the past, we, we were spread out across a lot of different markets and countries. And so we've been very intentional about consolidating and based on the market research we do, picking more specific markets within these regions to uh, where we know we can have some more success. So, you know, I'll just say, for instance, in, in Canada, you know, what was Robert's recommendation that we stop doing Quebec and, and uh, British Columbia and Alberta and really try to have success in Ontario first and build from there. And, and that's what we've begun to do. So but in terms of Asia, um, you know, there's a free trade agreement in place with Japan now that makes uh, wines from the U.S. tariff free. So it makes it a competitive place to have New York wines again. And then, you know, because of, um, I think China and Hong Kong in particular are now more important on uh, kind of the global stage in terms of, you know, WSET has a school there now. It's a growing Psalm community. Uh, uh, many New York winers that participate in the program have had success there. So that's where we are putting in our resources. Um, we, you know, do have as part of our application this year, Vietnam, um, because that, you know, as, as uh, Noralia, you, you say, it's, there's a growing wine culture. So, you know, if we continue to have trade issues in, in Hong Kong and China, we'll redirect resources to Vietnam. Uh, Philippines is another country that's come up, but, you know, we're really focused on being more targeted with the countries we focus in on so we can get the highest impact out of the, you know, really kind of limited resources we have for each region. Thanks, Sam. Uh, any other closing thoughts from you? Um, you know, I'll just, I know uh, Amy had a lot of great questions about like, you know, making the decision to participate in the program and, you know, asking are people just doing it for the benefit of the branding? I think um, I'll just, you know, share that there, there's a couple uh, wine brands that were successful this year that are under 5,000 cases. And, you know, one got a distributor in France, another, you know, got another distributor in the UK. So, you know, I, I think like Cape, Kelby said, everyone, I think, goes in with the intention that, you, you know, you're there to do business. And, um, but I would say, you know, given it, it's not a high cost to be involved. And I think, you know, at least on the, sh the surface level or the introductory level of, you know, potentially being featured in some of the international line publication is, is, is a um, really, I think, nice benefit because at least your wines are being reviewed and tasted, um, even though they may not be widely available in the market yet. Um, and then for the, you know, Long Island wineries that are on the call today, I, I would, you know, encourage you to speak with Mindy Crawford from Wolf First State. They've been long participants in the program. She's got a, a lot of experience with uh, exporting wines internationally. And I think she has a lot to offer in terms of her experience and, you know, how it's been a value to Wolfer, uh, you know, over the years. Great. All right. Well, uh, thank you all for your participation today. Uh, I know it's been uh, a long session, but I hope that you were able to take away uh, some positives about the New York Wine and Grape Foundation's export program. As I said, please do feel free to reach out with any questions um, and we'll be happy to assist you further. So uh, take care everyone and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.